Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson. This podcast is an integral part of my quantum work with people with personal transformation and spiritual healing programs and powerful guided meditations. If anything on this podcast has resonated with you and you'd like to explore how you could work with me, please reach out via my website at quantumliving.com.au. Whether you are listening to the show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, whatever the case may be, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Today I'd like to talk about the inner sanctuary. We are living in tumultuous times. With so much stress and uncertainty, so many moving pieces and reference points with nothing to hold on to. When things don't go to our plan, we suffer. Suffering becomes a part of our life with disastrous consequences. These are often the moments of the emotional rock bottom, when our trust and faith in our own strength and in divine providence are being tested. I often ask this question, do we really need to suffer? Do we need suffering in our life? And if so, why? Many people believe that suffering is an integral part of life that helps us grow. It is also a doctrine in many religious teachings, including Christianity, which says that suffering is a tool God uses to get our attention and to accomplish his purposes in our life. Do you remember the story of Scrooge? (laughs) And that suffering is not in itself a virtue, and when possible, it should be avoided. Interesting. This implies that it is possible, and in fact, desirable, to live a life without suffering. And indeed, the answer I receive from my spiritual guidance is that we need suffering for as long as it serves us, not a second more. When it no longer serves us, it simply goes away. This places the onus of responsibility to end our suffering squarely on us. Ah, responsibility. It's a big word and a big concept, which I might talk about on another episode. So the purpose of suffering, which has a wide spectrum, of course, from the tears of a child whose favorite toy was lost or broken, to the heartache of losing someone we love, to the physical and mental trauma caused by poverty and war, is the key we need to find. Why, we need to ask, what is the purpose of my suffering? What needs to change, how I need to change to make it go away? Sounds simple, but the universe is much more complex than that. Our life experience is much more complex than that. And so, even here, we are dealing with a paradox. (laughs) If you listen to my earlier episodes, you know that I love paradoxes. And the paradox is that, even if we consciously can't see the reason for the suffering we are going through, it does affect us at the unconscious level, slowly or rapidly, creating the required change until its job is done, until it has got our attention to whatever needed it, and then it goes away. And in those moments of suffering, when we've got nothing to hold on to, we need a safe refuge, our inner sanctuary. It is a place within us like the eye of a hurricane, calm, centered, undisturbed by the vicious winds destroying everything in their path. The place of knowing that we are safe and protected, and no matter what happens, everything is going to be just fine. And what if I die? I hear you ask. Well, if you are done here, and this is your soul's plan, and your exit point that will end your suffering, there is nothing you can do about it, and again, 
you will be just fine, continuing your soul journey on the other side. It is time for us to dissolve the fear of death, as we never really die. Your inner sanctuary is a place of connection with your soul, the place of insight and guidance you always receive once you've turned down the noise and listen. You go there in your meditation and in a deep prayer. You surrender your ego to the wisdom within. You are safe here. It is your inner sanctuary. Following an amazing conversation about the game of life I had with my special guest Marin Muter in the first episode of the new season 5 of my podcast, I have invited her back to my show as I feel she is just the right person to talk with about the inner sanctuary. You will find more information about Marin and her work in this episode show notes and in her guest profile on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. And now, Marin joins me again from the U.S. East Coast. Hello, Marin. Welcome back to Quantum Living. It's so lovely to be speaking with you again. <laughs> Thank you for having me back. I really enjoy having our conversations. <laughs> Wonderful. And thank you so much for your time, especially when, as I understand, you are dealing with a disaster of sorts. Gosh, I understand that you are affected by the flood and your house, in fact, has been damaged. That's a real challenge to stay calm and centered, which is exactly what we'll be talking about. But is everything under control with your house? What's happening? Well, I have amazing stories to tell you. Well, my, my driveway is completely gone. And the windows in my house, and I'm restoring kind of an old castle, and the windows with the storm, and I had very high winds along with the rain, have now become waterfalls. Uh. But the biggest thing that happened was yesterday, as I was moving a car that I have up by the, on top of the hill, and it's parked right next to what I call a moat but it's actually a fire pond. So just in case there's a fire at my house, we just would pump right from the pond. The fire department would do that. I call it a moat. And mm -hmm. as I was moving this car, just so it wasn't sitting for a long period of time without being turned on, the ground beneath the car while I was in it fell into this 30 foot pond. Oh no. And so, I'm in the car, my foot is on the brake because it's holding on by one tire on a route of some sort and the rest of the car is in the pond. So oh I'm frantically texting some of the people that are, are volunteering on the driveway trying to make it passable. And luckily, luckily, one of them had um, the excavator that could come up, it, it's a very slow moving excavator, or I was just sitting in there. It might have taken 30 seconds, but for me, it felt like a lifetime. Oh my and goodness. got the excavator up, hooked up the car and pulled us out. But if I had taken my foot off that brake, that wheel would have turned and I would have been in the water. Oh. So I had unbuckled myself. I had rolled the window down and in preparation of trying to get out of the car. So that's what it's like at my house right now. <laughs> I can't use the sink, so I'm living very um, rugged. <laughs> oh my goodness so sorry to hear that is there a progress in the repairs or do you still have heavy rains what's what's the weather like the weather today we had more heavy rains it's been raining for about 14 hours straight we had a couple days reprieve no one knew that the rain was going to be like it was today it was only supposed to sprinkle in the afternoon but it started far earlier and it is still going so I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, um, I'm thinking that quite possibly this winter I won't be able to stay up here just because things are going to be un so unstable. 
but we'll see. We'll see what happens when October comes around and I'll make a decision then. <laughs> oh my goodness. So sorry to hear that. Thank you for sharing. And yes, this is this is one of those challenging and testing situations that our life puts us in. And gosh, uh, talking about staying calm and centered. Mm -hmm. Well, as I said in my intro, we are living in such tumultuous times with so much stress and uncertainty, with so many moving pieces and reference points that we are often feeling like being trapped in quicksand or in water, <laughs> desperately seeking refuge and something we could hold on to. So let's talk about it. How can we find peace, calm, and be centered? How can we access our inner sanctuary, as I call it, to restore our trust and faith that we will be fine, no matter what we are going through? And how important it is that we do go within first before seeking outside help, which might be difficult to find anyway. Could you please speak to this? I think how I'm going to approach this is by going back to something you and I spoke about previously. And that was the picture of the calm beach that someone had said they want to live on. And in order to get that calm beach, yeah. I had said that, you know, we have to go through storms. When we look at a storm, we can't stop it. We can't control a storm. But if we look at how our life is set up, we are literally the eye of the storm. Okay, that might sound scary, but when we look at the eye of the storm, the eye of the storm is the calm center. And so if we have a lot of stuff going around in our life, things that we cannot control, we can't control the events that are happening around us, but what we do get to control is how we react and respond. How are we going to behave in these events. In order to make that decision, in order to be able to be calm, I want you to be able to envision a storm that we can see in the meteorologists and you see that big swirl of cloud. And I just want you to put yourself right in the middle, right in that eye. You will be safe. You will be okay. And as with all storms, they don't last forever. The storms will come and they will go. But as long as you stay in that center and we kind of envision that, we're going to be able to weather the storm. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful metaphor. I love it again. So when we go within, when we go to the eye of the storm, metaphorically speaking, what can we find there? For me, when I think of going into that eye of the storm, it's like being able to breathe. It's a fresh breath. It's not clinging on and having every muscle in my body tensed as I'm trying to hold on and swim in these huge waves or try to run through these winds that are head on. When I get into that center, I can breathe and I can then evaluate, how am I going to do this? What are my options? Because things become much clearer when we're in that center spot. So that's really what it looks like, grounding yourself, centering yourself. It's allowing yourself the chance to breathe. And when we do that, then our intuition comes in nice and strong, and we can really kind of look around and get our bearings. Again, we can't stop the events. That's not what we're capable of doing, but we can weather them. And we can weather them intact, in connection with our intuition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is actually a very important point, which I would like to ask you to, to elaborate on, because the question is, in my mind, which comes first in such moments of, of stress or, or distress? Do you first seek that connection with your spiritual self, with your higher self, self with your guardian angel, with your guides, whatever you might believe in. And then you follow that intuition and advice that, that you receive, which calms you down. And then you can start making rational decisions. Or is it the other way around? 
which is you first find within yourself that center and calm, which then opens up your intuition. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario, but which comes first? Because when we are in a difficult moment and it could be either stress or depression or or anger, anything that has pushed us out of kilt, if you like, out of balance. We don't think rationally. And so it is helpful to have instilled in our mind, this is what I need to do, like the first step. So is it seeking the connection with your spiritual guidance, your intuition first, or is it calming yourself down and finding that peace within, which then opens up your intuition? (laughs) that's a very good question we are created by our consciousness as an observational vehicle a tool for our consciousness to kind of look at earth from our vantage point which is a very unique vantage point we are never disconnected from our intuition or our consciousness But what happens is life provides a lot of noise. And sometimes that noise drowns out the intuitive sensations or the intuitive um, promptings. So in order to do that, we need to step in and we need to take that breath. Because if we start seeking the guidance from our intuition, or if you believe in spirit guides or or whatever it is that you believe in, amongst that noise, everything is going to be fighting. And you're gonna feel like you can't hear them. You're gonna feel like they gave up on you. Nobody's listening to you. They're not answering you. But what's happening is life's noise is just really loud. And we need to turn life's noise down. Like I said, can't get rid of the situations, but what we can do Let's take a nice calm breath and allow ourselves to relax. We want to relax our muscles and then we can start listening because that's when it's going to come in a lot louder and a lot clearer. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. And in fact, it really does make sense. And what you just said is really important, a very important point, which I feel escapes a lot of people. And it is so important, which is that we are always connected. We We never lose that connection. So the information, the guidance, the insight is always there, always flowing, but we don't hear it because of that noise. So thank you. This is, I feel this is really, really important. And on an ongoing basis, obviously a practice such as meditation, regular meditation, or even mindfulness or yoga, all those practices that help us become centered and quiet within I would think will strengthen that ability. But it is so extremely important what you have said, that the connection is always there. We are never disconnected, even if we feel or think that we are. So all we need to do is to turn down the noise, and then the window will open and we actually start hearing. Oh, I'm loving this. Oh, thank you. Speaking of centering and calming, some years ago, I came across a beautiful quote, which I believe is written by the late Louise Hay. I have printed it on a small card, and I read it quite often. I'd like to read it at now. Good. I want to hear it. In the infinity of life where I am, all is perfect, whole and complete. 
I believe in a power far greater than I am that flows through me every moment of every day. I open myself to the wisdom within, knowing that there is only one intelligence in this universe. Out of this one intelligence come all the answers, all the solutions, all the healings, all the new creations. I trust this power and intelligence, knowing that whatever I need to know is revealed to me, and that whatever I need comes to me in the right time, space, and sequence. All is well in my world. That's beautiful. <laughs> you know, even now when I was reading it, I was getting goosebumps. It connects you with what you can forget about. You know, that is fabulous, what you can forget about. You were talking about meditation just a moment ago, and I'm going to say something really quickly. When you're reading the poem, I can see why you do meditations, because your voice is so soothing and so calming. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to say that quickly. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> when you were talking about yoga, meditations, and things like that, what I want to say is going going with you on forgetting about other things. You should practice doing yoga and meditation when you're doing your own practices without using words, without saying mantra. And the reason I recommend this is because language is a communication tool between people. And the ethereal is not speaking language like we are. Yes. The ethereal doesn't need to speak earthbound language. So if you can go into yoga, if you can do your meditation and just stop talking to yourself or trying to use a mantra, and if you have to use a mantra, use the exact same word over and over and over again, not a saying, not a slogan, because what that's going to do is that one word is going to start transitioning just into a vibration. And that's where we want to be. We're looking to create resonance. We're looking to touch vibration. And when we use words or sayings that we're talking about, then our brain starts envisioning those things and it's still creating noise. So to get out of the noise, we need to step into vibration. It's not raising a vibration. It's not lowering a vibration. We're looking for our personal signature our resonance that will harmonize with the overarching consciousness. Wow. You know, both in the previous episode and now, what I find is that to every question, to every topic, every issue, I'm just getting pearls of wisdom from you. <laughs> thank you. We are getting pearls of wisdom from you. So thank you. Vibration. This is about our vibration, which will then resonate and entrain with the frequency of the universe of all that is of our intuition. Oh gosh, thank you. What other practices would you recommend that we do in order to cultivate our relationship with our higher self, the soul, the creator, the most important relationship that we have? And what happens when this relationship is broken in our mind, obviously, and how to restore it so that we never feel alone. And there are many people, especially now in these times, that feel abandoned, feel alone, feel without help, feel basically, well, I'm going through all those difficult and challenging situations, and and I'm all alone here. So what else could we do apart from meditation, yoga, 
maybe mm -hmm. prayer. Is there anything in particular that you could recommend? I think that I would like to start with meditation, but we're going to look at meditation just a little bit differently. And what we're going to look at is how do we develop what's called a living or walking meditation, which means that you are going to be able to slip into a meditative state, even a very deep meditative state, almost a transcendental meditative state, while simultaneously being fully awake and cognizant and going about your everyday life, whether it's interacting with people, doing the dishes, going to work. And the way that we practice this is we don't want to do meditation every single day. What we want to do is start spreading our meditation out with a day in between, two days in between, three days in between. And during that break between the meditative states that you have traditionally learned or that you're learning off of um, YouTube or going to meditation retreats, what you want to do is remember what it feels like to be in that state. Then those days in between, no matter what you're doing, see if you can call upon that sensation. So we just want to feel that sensation in our body, that, that sensation that removes the delineation between our body and the outside environment, where it kind of feathers those edges. And see if you can call upon that, even if it's just for a split second, or even if it's for 30 seconds, because that feeling is going to be the feeling that's going to help you get into that eye of the storm. That feeling is going to help you connect and understand where other people are coming from. We've heard this saying, you know, if you could only walk in someone else's shoes. Well, we can't really ever walk in someone else's shoes because their perspective is theirs and theirs alone, just like yours is yours and yours alone. But what we can do is we can resonate and resonate is a big word. It's a big, powerful word in our life. We can resonate with the vibration of the environment. And that's where this delineation starts getting felt. And when we do that, then all of a sudden we start having a woven connection with the people we're interacting with, whether that's a good interaction or a bad interaction, but we can have that interaction just the same and still remain calm and have that intuition loud and free and clear no matter what we're going through. So that would be what I would say to play with is play with branching out that meditation Give yourself a few days in between and see if you can call upon that no matter what you're doing. Mm. Thank you. Very, very good recommendation. And in fact, it reminds me and it links to the um, information I came across. You know, when people are teaching resilience, so they're running like resilience courses and resilience programs, what this is all about is not about not getting stressed out when something bad or uncomfortable happens, but to, as they call it, to increase our baseline, our emotional baseline to a higher level so that when those difficult situations and, and challenges occur, when we do get stressed out or sad or depressed, we are not falling down, say, 100 meters, but maybe only 20 meters because then it's much easier for us and much quicker to get out of this hole. And I also find it interesting your suggestion to spread out your regular meditation practice, to not to do it every single day, as most people recommend, but maybe every second day. And those days when you don't sit down for your meditation, you are attempting to recall that sensation. And by the way, I know exactly what you are talking about because I teach theta meditation. So that's when you lower your brain waves down to the theta state, which is that very elusive state just between our awakened state and dream state, between four and eight hertz per second in terms of our brain waves. And in this state, we usually lose the sensation of our body. 
and you feel that we are just connected with everything. We are basically pure consciousness. And yes, it can be done with your eyes open, like, for example, walking meditation on the beach, even when washing the dishes or doing whatever. It is possible. And with practice, and again, we develop and embed new habits with practice, it then becomes much easier for us to get out of the hole if we fell into it, metaphorically speaking, obviously. Uh, I'm not making any references to your <laughs> to your car incident. Even then, I, I, <laughs> I did that. I actually went into that state because I was just like, well, <laughs> this is what's going to happen. I had no control. Was there a message for you from your higher self? No. No? No. Okay. So that was no. just... <laughs> no. I believe that I'm going to be experiencing everything. So in my idea of how our reality or our, our life is actually set up is both things would have happened to me yesterday, meaning that I have these trajectories and one trajectory is here talking to you now and the other trajectory went into the water and however that ended, that ended. So either maybe I got all wet and I had a totally different story to tell you or I'm in the hospital or I didn't make it. So I believe that all of those trajectories played out. And the reason I believe this is like we were talking about before with the apple. In order for our life to be whole and total and complete, then we need to be able to experience all of the sides of the event. Because then we have an understanding, a complete understanding of what happened. Because if we only get to have one side of the event, then it's like holding that apple up and we only get to see that skin side of the apple, which really doesn't make any sense because our consciousness or whatever you believe is on the other side wants you to be whole, wants you to be total and wants you to be complete because it has immense love for you. And in order to savor that apple, you've got to taste the meat, the center of the apple. So I just let go in the car. I was like, well, here we go. And I'm playing out a lot. Of, so it gave me a lot of humility because I understood at that moment that there's a lot more going on in this situation than me just sitting in the car, putting my foot on the brake. In terms of those other, those other trajectories. Exactly. At that moment, I was going to die. Correct. And I did. So in that point of decision that put you on this trajectory. What was the trigger? What what made that decision to this one as opposed to ending up in a hospital, for example, or or dying? Well are you aware of what was the trigger? There was really no trigger. I would say the trigger to that event happening was the water or, you know, giving way of the earth and the earth falling in. So I had no control over that. It wasn't my decision to have that happen. But it was just an event that I was experiencing here on Earth, from this earthbound perspective. Now, as we were mm. talking about before, it feels like I'm only on one trajectory, because of this very unique and intricate veiling system that our brain does. Our brain in this particle in this body is veiling every single side of every single choice. And we don't talk about that often because it's not something that has been traditionally spoken about. So it's a brand new concept and it's huge to get your head wrapped around. Typically, when we talk about the veil, we're talking about the veil that your brain is making between here and the ethereal. So we only have two sides of this veil, but our brain is amazing. And it veils out every single one of these trajectories. It's like just putting a little thin film between each one. and Every single trajectory thinks that it, that is the only one that we're on, <laughs> but we're on all of them. So I didn't make a decision on which trajectory I'm going to be looking at because my brain is allowing my consciousness to look at all of them at the same time. Okay, so would you be able to 
shift your consciousness, even, I'm not saying as your life experience, but in terms of your reflection, are you able to shift your consciousness onto one of those other possible trajectories and in your mind to follow, okay, so so I was injured and I was taken into hospital and are you able to follow it in your mind or does it remain veiled off, if you like? Yeah. <laughs> that. That is such a common question. <laughs> Thank you for asking it because I'm sure that there's many people listening to this going, well, what if? And they're saying, Thank you, Anna, for asking this. And what comes to mind is what some people refer to as quantum jumps. So they say that our consciousness can, or we can learn how to jump, literally, so they're called quantum jumps from one timeline to another, to another, and actually live there. So I just wanted to add this at this point, because as you said, a lot of people are familiar with this concept. So they will be uh, <laughs> listening very closely. So please elaborate. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> All I'm going to say is hold on to your hats and glasses. Okay. We're holding. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Okay, yep. And I will get to the quantum jumps. I'll, I'll put mm -hmm. that into this answer. I'm, I'm thinking how to formulate this the best that I can. We are the thought, this body, which is the size of a particle on the grand universal scale. We are no bigger than the teeniest, tiniest particle. And we are a wave of frequency. And we have our very own signature of frequency. Now, what does that mean? Because there is intelligence, because we have a consciousness, but our consciousness does not reside inside this body. And I think this is where things become confusing to people because we believe that our consciousness is inside this body and we believe that it is the consciousness that is inside this body that is viewing this life. So what we're going to do just for a moment is we're going to step out. We're going to step way out of our body and we're going to look at our body from outside of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that is where our consciousness actually resides. And our consciousness, because it is thinking, has a thought process. And this particle that I am, I'm going to use myself as an example, that Marin is, I am the actual thought process of my consciousness. So with that being said, when we have all of these different trajectories going on, what's happening is our consciousness or my consciousness can see all of them play out just as real, just as tangible as we feel right now. It's watching every single possibility happen. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to jump from one vantage point to another vantage point because we're already experiencing it. Our consciousness is already viewing it and it's already absorbed in it, in its thought process of all these different possibilities. It's kind of like if you were sitting on the chair and you started having daydreams. Well, you haven't left your chair, but you're having daydreams and you can see yourself in these daydreams and you can have multiple daydreams going on at the exact same time. Yeah. But the you in one daydream is not interacting with the you on the other daydream. And you don't actually have to have the you on one daydream jump over to the other one because you're already there. Okay, now we'll go into a quantum jump really quick. You cannot jump from one trajectory to another. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, is sometimes when we get into a juncture point, and I'm going to use my experience yesterday, that we might have a sharp exit on one of the trajectories right at a branching point, right when we are at um, the ice cream store picking chocolate or vanilla, okay? And let's say that the chocolate choice ended up passing out because the chocolate was so great, we had a heart attack and we died. <laughs> and the vanilla choice, didn't have that reaction and the vanilla choice kept going. Sometimes when it feels like there is this quantum jump, is it, it's a sharp cutoff of the chocolate. And so you literally feel that veil go and go away and 
there you are, you're still here with the vanilla trajectory. You didn't jump, you had one trajectory that ended. It's kind of like a weird version of a deja vu-ish feeling sometimes. Um, but that's that's what happens. And that's why people think that they've quantum jumped from one trajectory to another and they keep doing that. Quite possibly their brain is like a stick shift when you're trying to drive a stick shift and it's shifting gears when it dies <laughs> and you're jumping mm -hmm. and you're like, <laughs> okay, that one's done. And, <laughs> and here I am on this one. Um, but it's the same particle. It's, yeah. You're not jumping, you're not shifting, you're not um, deleting one like intentionally it's just hit its end point because we have to play out every single one we play out every single possibility and every single end point so if you've ever heard the saying you're going to die a thousand deaths you literally are going to die a thousand deaths because they balance each other all the way throughout the life whether it's at six years old or 108 years old or even in utero you're playing it all yes. out Thank you for that. I'd like to give an example from my own life that happened um, many years ago. I had a, a punctured tire in my car. So I swapped the tires, you know, using the spare one. And then I was going to take that punctured tire to be repaired. By the way, no one had access to my car. And it took me a few weeks and I remember I was really stressed out about it because I had little money. And so I went to the mechanics shop. He checked the tire and said, there's no puncture. Now, a puncture doesn't heal itself because I asked him, I said, there was puncture. I know because he said, well, I don't know how, but there is no puncture. The tire is fine. It's, it's perfectly okay. So I said, okay, I'm going to put this into, <laughs> into my box of unexplained phenomena whether it was quantum jump or manifestation or, or grace of God or whatever, the tire healed itself, put it this way. And there was no puncture, had no expense. No one has access, had access to my car. So there is absolutely no logical explanation for this. What do you think had happened? <laughs> okay, again, there's going to be a couple things here. And I'm just going <laughs> to stay on the ethereal side of this one. Mm -hmm. So... We are going to look at the word relevance and our consciousness. Remember, we are the thought process of our consciousness. Okay. How many times have you had an imagination? You're like, eh, I don't like that part. Mm -hmm. And you kind of go back and you're like, eh, okay, there we go. I don't, I don't want to have that part. Literally, you might have had a puncture in your tire and somewhere on that drive, between where you had that puncture on your tire and going to the auto body shop to have it repaired, that puncture became irrelevant to your life experience. And therefore there is no more puncture. We are, our entire life is a hologram. We in this body do not get to change the events. We have no control over that. No matter how much we think we're manifesting the control of, we don't get to pick the events in our life. Like I said, Believe me, if you had um, to choose between having a puncture in your tire or having someone you love coming back and you can manifest one of those two things, you'll probably pick the person you love over the flat tire. Okay, the flat tire doesn't, even if it meant scrimping and saving to get a new tire. So we, we do need to take the idea of manifestation with a grain of salt. But we can look at relevance. And relevance is an ethereal subject it's not earthbound now and I, and i was thinking what i wanted to say but i think that's the most important thing that i wanted to say is somewhere that flat tire became irrelevant my gut on this one is just saying that it became irrelevant and somehow the heat driving your tire came in and put the rubber back together and whatever nail you had in it came out and it just kind of closed it up, closed itself up because it wasn't relevant anymore. Thank you. Well, all I can say 
at this point is that because you have just opened so many rabbit holes, I would love us to continue this conversation, basically. And I think that the next one would be about manifestation, which is such a huge topic these days. And everyone has an opinion and and, and practice. And so, <laughs> and that's good because the more we think about it, the more we talk about it, the more we practice various approaches, the closer we'll come to the truth, I believe, at I some point. Or maybe not. Or maybe we will come and will not come to the truth. Whatever the case may be. We will all be. know the truth when this when we're done here. When we're done here. <laughs> we will we will know the truth. Don't worry, everybody. I promise you your questions are gonna be answered. <laughs> one day. One day. <laughs> okay, Maren. Yes, so time is, is catching up with us, but as I said, I would love to continue our conversations. What I would like to ask you now, a couple of things. I believe that your book has been published. <laughs> Yes, I and did. I will include a link in the show notes. But I might ask you to just very, again, give us a brief overview of sure. the book. And we talked about it in the last episode, so just like a snapshot. And also, and especially, I might ask you to tell us about your fireside chats. So could you please speak for a moment about your book and, and those fire fireside gatherings and how people could join them if it's possible? Well, the book is looking at our life from the ethereal side. And basically, it's going to show you how special your life is. And I've written it in the form of a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> but we'll, what we'll do is we're going to go on a little adventure in the book. And we're going to look at many different questions. The first one is, how how is your life whole, total, and complete? We're going to look at um soul contracts what does that mean and are there soul contracts we're going to look at karma we're going to look at will you ever see your loved one again uh, and many more subjects are briefly touched on in this book there will be other books that might look into these subjects a little bit deeper but this will give you an idea of how things are working now the fireside chats are absolutely wonderful and it's a big community and we all get together and every month um, they're opened with maybe a little bit of a different subject but everyone is welcome to participate everyone is welcome to ask whatever questions they want to ask and we discuss them and it's on zoom and there's no cost you just come on to my website marinmuter.com it will tell you when the firesides are if you are a site member you automatically get a link to the fireside chats if you are not a site member and you want to join in you will just register for the fireside chat again there there is no cost i do everything i i do is on a complimentary basis mm. so being that this is online how many people can you have in one meeting uh, the largest meeting I've had is 250. Wow. Um, yeah. And then I started moving around and I, and I stopped doing them for a few months. And then now we're at back to a smaller group, which is about 40 people uh -huh. on average. More manageable. Which is wonderful. Yeah. Um, but we'll see what happens. I'm not consistent on social media and I'm not consistently pushing myself out there. <laughs> so people tend to forget. <laughs> That's okay though. And how long are those meetings? One hour or half an hour, one hour? They're Yeah, they're scheduled for an hour. An hour. And they often go almost <laughs> two hours <laughs> because the conversations are so wonderful and the questions and the discussions are just rich. So even if you can't make it at the beginning, hop on. <laughs> Even if you're late, you're not. You're still going to have a very good experience. What time? Obviously, there is a time difference because I'm in Australia. But what time usually in your time zone do they happen? So I have, yeah, I have two sessions because there are people from all over the world. The first session, U.S. time, is on a Sunday. It's usually the third Sunday of the month, mm -hmm. and the first session starts at. 10 30 eastern time in the morning mm -hmm. and the second session starts at 7 30 p.m 
Eastern time that afternoon. Okay. And so you're welcome to one or yeah. the other, but I try to make it so wherever you are in the world, you can join in. So with 250 people, or even even 100, which is a really large number, how do you manage the conversation? Because clearly not everyone will even get a chance to say anything. That's magic. That's magic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about, I have chats going. And then um, also if someone is, you know, they want to raise their hand. We might not get to everybody, but I, I, the reason why it goes over is because I don't want someone to leave feeling like they weren't mm. heard or their question wasn't answered. So that's why they go over because I will sit and take the time to talk to them and to answer them. If I see in the chats that there are multiple questions asking a very similar mm -hmm. question, then I'll answer that, you know, as a as a group question. And then if there's follow-ups, people usually will write, ah, but what mm -hmm. about this? Beautiful. Oh, thank you for, for explaining. And uh, as you said, there is a link on your website and that link will be in the show notes. So people who are interested will be able to access it. Okay, Marin, what would be your message to those who feel like they are in quicksand or they are drowning and there is no escape? What would you like to say to them as a final thought? It is, it is very sensitive to be in that position, to feel like you're drowning, and especially in quicksand and there's nobody there to help you. I think that circles us all the way back to the beginning of this conversation. We might not be able to control the situations that are going on, and quicksand is very scary. But what we learn about literal quicksand is, the more you panic, the quicker you sink. And if we can find ourselves in the eye of that storm, if we can give ourselves just a momentarily, a momentary reprieve for us to catch our breath, even if we're just sticking our head out barely of that quicksand and spread our arms out and feel for the sides, we will be able to get out of it because this too shall pass. Storms might feel like they're lasting a long time because we're in them, but they ebb and flow, they come and go. So you're not going to be there forever. Be kind to yourself. I think that's the best thing. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautifully said. So our final refuge and perhaps the only refuge, the only true refuge that we have is our inner sanctuary. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maren. It's been so lovely to be speaking with you on Quantum Living. And as I said, I, I would love to have you back again. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well. <laughs>